Welcome to the uh, third edition of the Future of Healthcare Forum. I'm Robert Patterson. I'm a healthcare and employee benefits attorney at Von Schenick and King. Uh, my firm is very pleased to join with the Lumsden and McCormick CPA firm to present today's forum. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists. They're not up here yet, they're, but they're here uh, for taking time out of their schedules to join us and share their thoughts uh, with the Western New York healthcare community. Um, we're going to start our program today with a uh, keynote presentation and then have a moderated panel discussion and then finish with uh, a question and answer session. So if, you, if questions occur to you during the program, uh, write them down or think about them and we'll get to you later. Uh, we're going to have microphones on both sides of the auditorium for the Q&A session. I now have the pleasure to introduce our moderator, Larry Zielinski. Uh, Larry has led successful organizations in both healthcare and banking uh, over the last 35 years, including Buffalo General Hospital, the Visiting Nursing Association of Western New York, and Gold Dome Bank. He now runs his own healthcare consulting practice, serving clients in all areas of healthcare delivery system, systems, and works with physicians on collaborative strategy, str strategies uh, to build their practices. Larry is also an adjunct faculty member at the University of Buffalo School of Management, uh, teaching MBA courses in the business of healthcare and healthcare innovation, and is currently serving as the acting executive director of the university's Office of Alumni Engagement. Larry, thank you for serving as moderator. Thanks, Rob, for uh, the introduction. Um, and on behalf of uh, all of my colleagues at the UB School of Management, it's my pleasure to facilitate this morning. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have a really engaging topic and uh, a terrific uh, keynote speaker. And then we'll be followed, as Rob said, by a, a terrific regional panel of healthcare leaders uh, to comment on the, uh, the presentation. And, and then that'll be followed by, we have a kind of an extended Q&A session, as Rob mentioned. So if you have questions, please uh, hold them. And we'll have mics that'll be passed around the room. We'll hope that'll be a, uh, an engaging uh, part of the presentation. Let me introduce our, our keynote speaker. Carissa Price is the president of the Emerging Businesses Division of Healthways. Now, Healthways is a health and well-being improvement solution company for employers, health plans, and health systems. They leverage more than 30 years of innovation and research to effectively transform the health of people and the communities where they live, work, and play. Carissa is responsible for three of Healthways growth businesses, the Blue Zones Project, which is the subject of her presentation today, uh, the Ornish Heart Disease Reversal Program, and the Healthways Diabetes Service. She's also responsible for Healthways strategic partnerships with Gallup and the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index. That index is kind of like the Dow Jones of health, giving a daily measure of people's well-being uh, at the close of every day. Carissa has been a consultant for Fortune 100 companies, a co-founder of a healthcare startup, and has led product development, marketing, business development, and strategy for a healthcare technology joint venture between Intel and GE. She's a graduate of Harvard University, holding a doctorate degree in international political economy. Ladies and gentlemen, Carissa Price. Good morning, everyone. Let's see if I can get this up. Here we go. Well, I really want to thank uh, all of you for coming this morning. I know it's, it's early, at least for those of us from the West Coast, it's really early. Um, I want to thank our sponsors for putting this on. Um, when they reached out and said, you know, can you come and talk about something in well-being, um, it's really a, a privilege to have an audience like this to really talk about something that we at Healthways are very passionate about um, and have been doing for 30 years. Well-being is really um, a concept that's comprised of a bunch of different elements, and you'll hear me talk about them um, as they relate to Blue Zones, but it really is um, a passionate subject for myself um, as well as our team uh, here. So thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to talk about that. So 
blue zones, and we'll talk about that, but I want to lay some context for why this matters. And most of you, I'm going to guess, are in healthcare, so this isn't a surprise slide or supply, uh, surprise statistic. But in the $3 trillion that we're spending on healthcare today as a nation, chronic disease makes up the vast bulk of that. And chronic disease, for the most part, is lifestyle related. Yes, some very small part of that is genetic, but the mass majority of the drivers of this spend is actually lifestyle choices. So when it comes down to well-being and why we focus on well-being, it isn't because we're altruistic or it's nice. That's where the money is. That's where we're spending our money. And we try to help our clients reduce that or make that spend at least more efficient. And our society to be better off in terms of looking at the person as a whole and helping make people, helping people make the behavior changes that they need to make. So I thanked our sponsors, so what I'm about to say is in no way a dig to them, but I just want to give an example of how we approach well-being and what Blue Zones is really about. So Blue Zones, at the heart of it, is making the healthy choice the easy choice. If you look at that buffet table that we all just spent the last half an hour at, the healthy choice was not the easy choice. This is not the only place where that happens. Even in healthcare, within our own industry, we do not make the healthy choice the easy choice. I cannot tell you how many conferences we go to where that is breakfast. That is not a healthy choice. And again, no slam to our sponsors. Uh, they're not alone, right? So at heart, how do we make the healthy choice the easy choice? Most of us in this country, I grew up in Idaho. I walk to school, right? Kids don't walk to school anymore. And you'll hear me talk a little bit about that. We sit at desks for eight, 10 hours a day. That's not the healthy choice. How many of you have office space where people can have a standing desk or a treadmill desk? So these are those little things about, if you start to catalog your own life, about how difficult it is to have a healthy lifestyle on a daily basis. Our neighborhoods and homes aren't designed that way. Our communities aren't designed that way. And so the healthy choice is not the easy choice. The healthy choice becomes the, ugh. I have to go to the gym, and I have to drive across town, and I've got traffic, and I've got this, and I've got that. That's not making the healthy choice the easy choice. So at heart, that's what Blue Zones is about. We work with communities to help them transform themselves so that for anyone who's living within that community, the healthy choice is the easy choice. So what determines our health? As I just said on the chronic disease one, genetics makes up 20% only of health. Environment is another 20%. Healthy behaviors is 50%. Choosing that donut hole this morning, you're not alone. Choosing to sit down and not move, you're not alone. That is what's driving that chronic disease. Access to healthcare, which people spend a lot of time and energy talking about, is only 10%. So Blue Zones, the concept of it, is based on a 15-year study by Dan Buettner. So Dan Buettner went out, was hired by National Geographic to look at places in the world where people live longer and more vitally than else. So he discovered five of them, um, and that's what the foundation of our work at Blue Zones Project is really about. And so when I say live longer, these are people who are living to 100 and beyond in larger than average numbers, and they're living to 100 and beyond well. So they have their faculties, they're able to reason, they're able to participate in their communities, they're caring for their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren, they're active members of their civic society, many of them are out there you know, fishing and, and, and doing their activities still to 100 and beyond. That's the essence of what the difference can make when you have a community that actually is producing these kinds of outcomes. So there's five of them, and we have the book. We're happy to, to share the book with anyone who's interested. I think you can find it online at Amazon. Um, I'm not here to sell books. Um, so what do they have in common? So he spent many years looking at, there's five of them out in the world, Okinawa, Sardinia, um, I always forget the, the, the Turkish island one, um, Loma Linda, California, so very near to where I live, is the only one in the US, and we'll talk a little bit about why that is, and then Costa Rica, the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica. So Dan and his team spent time in these communities, interviewing these people, interviewing and looking at the surrounding environment, and looking at what, what was producing this outcome. We took that in partnership with Dan Buettner, and that became the framework that we used to work with communities to say, OK, if this is happening naturally here, can we reverse engineer that and say we can help communities go from wherever they are on the continuum of well-being and improve that? And so that's essentially, and you'll hear us talk about it today, of what is in those elements, right? What is, what's driving this? 
So these are longevity hotspots. There they are. Icar Icaria is the other one. Um, and people live 12 more good years than US citizens, with the exception of Loma Linda, where it's Seventh day Adventist, actually, Loma Linda, that's driving this outcome. You know, Germans are known for their efficiency, right, and their hard work ethic. But at 5 o'clock, if you walk around Munich, People are outside, they're riding their bikes, they're in cafes, they're enjoying each other's company. They downshift into a relaxed thing. They leave their work behind and they go and do something else of, of personal pleasure with, with social connectedness. The 80% rule. So do you know when to stop that 80-20 rule, which we're all familiar about? Plant slant. So this is not a blueprint that says you have to be a vegetarian, you have to give up meat altogether. But in Dan's research, he came across the fact that in most of these communities, with the exception of the Seventh-day Adventists, they were natural vegetarians. A lot of them had economic hardship in their cultural backgrounds, so Okinawa before and after the war, um, in Sardinia just because of where this village was located. So meat was eaten in very small quantities. They weren't vegetarians. They weren't like, oh, no, I'm not eating meat. It was that they just didn't have it. They couldn't afford to have it in their diet, and so they ate it sparingly but it has substantial consequences of how their longevity is impacted. Wine at five, this is one of my favorite principles of Blue Zones. <laughs> if one glass of wine at five is good for you, two certainly must be even better. Uh, but the concept here, right, is again back to what I said about Munich, Germany, where people are getting off of work, they're going out, they're not having a glass of wine to drown their sorrows by themselves in their home. Right? This is a social event, this is something that people come together, they're relaxing, they're having wine at five. And the bottom of this pyramid really is family first. People in these naturally occurring blue zones have a very strong sense of family. Here in the US, we have broken those bonds, right? For the most part, we're putting our elders in nursing homes or assisted living facilities somewhere else. In the naturally occurring blue zones, that doesn't happen. The elders are part of the family. They're revered as part of the family. They're taking care of the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, their neighbor's kids. They're in the home still, and that sense of family is extremely strong and extremely prevalent in these communities. Belonging, belonging in the right tribe, right? So in many ways, these are interconnected, but they're elements that we work with because they are separate into themselves and they feed each other. So do you belong to a faith? In most of these naturally occurring blue zones, there is a faith aspect of this. But in essence, it's about belonging. It's about having a sense of respect for um, a community and a set of values and beliefs. It doesn't matter what the religious faith is. That's not the point here. It's that you belong to some place that has that um, aspect of spirituality and worship. And the right tribe, that you've been able to find your right tribe to do things. Again, people in these natural occurring blue zones aren't spending a lot of time alone. Uh, a, an advisor of mine in graduate school, Bob Putnam, wrote a book called Bowling Alone, and this was easily 20 years ago. Right, where he had studied our society here in the US, and that was the title, is we're bowling alone. We increasingly spend more and more time here in the US alone. That doesn't occur in these natural occurring blue zones. People have tribes when they go out for their power walks, or they do their yoga, or they do their knitting. They're doing it together. And there is a sense of connectivity there that really feeds these other elements in very powerful ways. So Dan has written about these things. It's been widely covered. We formed this partnership with him, as I said before, to, to reverse engineer and say, if this is the elements that matter, how can we help communities actually develop these elements to, to move their, um, their results on the well-being spectrum forward? So we transform places, people, and policy to make healthy choices easier, right? So we don't come in with um, a predetermined notion of what Buffalo should do. This is a community engagement project, where we come in with, in communities where people say, they raise their own hand and say, I want to make the healthy choice the easy choice. I want to be a part of transforming my community. And so we go in and we work with a variety of different stakeholders in the community to say, well, what are your goals? So we'll do a measurement, and I'll talk a little bit about that, of where are you today and where do you want to go? And what the elements are that your community chooses is completely up to you. It's completely up to the stakeholders to decide on this buffet menu of pieces, what matters to you, Buffalo? What are the pieces that you want to work on? And then we help our communities do that. So as you heard me say in the beginning, this isn't an altruistic endeavor. So our sponsors, the people who actually put up the money to transform their communities, are looking for an ROI, and we deliver that to them. So we have 
policies, people, and places programs. That's a lot of P's. It's early in the morning. But we measure our progress on those elements, and we measure our ability to impact that community's well-being over time. Most of these engagements, this is not something we didn't get to this state of affairs in a day, and you're certainly not going to transform it in a day. So most of these engagements are three to five years and beyond in order to see any kind of impact on making the healthy choice the easy choice. But we do have the evidence, the validated evidence, to show that we can drive lower health care costs, higher productivity, and create a better place to live, work, and play for people. And a lot of our Blue Zones get a lot of positive publicity about this as well. So one of the positive externalities, if you will, is that communities are able to attract more grant money because they've got a program in place that creates a framework that outside funders and donors can see, well, yeah, I want to be a part of that. And I can see that these guys know what they're doing. They have a plan. I'm willing to sponsor elements of this. So costs come down and well-being goes up when you do something like this. And these are some of the numbers about how we're measuring these outcomes of what the real drivers of that ROI are. So 2.2% reduction in likelihood of a hospital admission in a Blue Zone community. 1.7% likelihood, less of a likelihood of an ER visit. I mean, these are numbers, right, that we all, we all look at in healthcare and do a lot of complicated things to try to drive. But over time, imagine what those impacts could be for everyone in the healthcare ecosystem if we were able to sustain reductions like this. 1% like, less likelihood of incurring healthcare costs for a person in a blue zone. That's a, that's a big number, right? It can add up quickly. So performance also goes up when well-being goes up. And this we know not just from our blue zones work, but across all of our healthcare um, and, and population health business. So workforce well-being, most of us spend the majority of our time every day at work. So where you work has a huge impact on your health care costs. Well, those of you who are employers also understand the cost to you when that's not going in a positive direction, right? So we have um, very large um, self-insured employers as clients that we work with in well-being. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of scientific rigor understanding what are the drivers of workplace well-being and how do we impact that in a positive way. So in terms of the productivity, we are able to demonstrate a 5% reduction in unscheduled absences. 24% lower presenteeism. So presenteeism, for those of you who don't know, is measured as something of you're at work, but you're not really doing your job. You're thinking about your mom being in the ER because she fell and broke her hip. Or you're thinking about your child who's home with grandma because she has a cold and you're stressed out about this. This is a real driver of productivity. We have a 5% higher reported job performance. We measure that. We have, and I'll tell you a little bit about the well-being index and how we measure these things. Um, but that people are more satisfied and they're happier and have a better sense of purpose. Guess what? They perform better at work. Think about it for yourself. When you're happy and you're having a good day, aren't you more on top of it and you're feeling your game and you get a lot more done? If you're sad or depressed or stressed out, your day doesn't go as quickly and it certainly doesn't go as productively. 6% more days of best work in the 28-day period. That is the kind of measurement of what I was just describing, right? Of are you doing your best work when you're there? Do you feel inspired to go to work and do your best work? That matters to our employer clients. So at the end of the day, how does this add up? Uh -uh. So by working in Blue Zones, and this are results from our Beach Cities um, uh, Blue Zones community. So Beach Cities, for those of you who don't know, is in California. It's Hermosa, Redondo, and Manhattan Beach. They have a health district there that sponsor Blue Zones, um, and we have readouts for any of you who are interested, um, that we were able to have a 10.4% risk reduction through the Blue Zones work over time, which generated $42 million in value, additional value, for this community. And this is measured, again, by the things I was just telling you about the variables that drive this, right? So productivity gains, reductions in healthcare costs. Um, these are real numbers. As I said before, this isn't just a squishy, nice thing to do. These are real numbers that impact communities' bottom line. So how do we do this? Making the healthy choice the easy choice. We engage communities. Engagement is a huge issue. So our colleagues at Gallup, um, have spent time looking at our data across our different communities and can tell you that there are tipping points in communities. So engagement is a huge issue here. You have to have at least 40% of your community's population engaged in order to have sustainable well-being improvements. You have to have 
70% of your community aware that there is a Blue Zones project there in order to see that sustainable engagement in, in well-being. You have to have a greater than 70% of people who recognize a positive impact on themselves in order to have it sustained over time. So that's what I mean when we work with the community, we are measuring very scientifically what are the levers that work to produce the outcomes that produce this kind of financial savings. So we engage communities. We literally transform where people live, work, and play. So we can show some examples of the built environment people piece of this, which has a tremendous impact. And it goes back to the simple things we were talking about before. We have walking school bus programs. Most of our communities adopt, choose to adopt this as part of their looking at their schools. We work with schools, we work with cities and city planners, we work with religious organizations, employers, every stakeholder in a community that's having an impact on where we live, work, and play, we invite to the table to participate in this. So walking school buses are a tremendous impact in communities where kids are no longer being driven and dropped off at school and sitting in a classroom all day. They're actually walking to school with their community. Well, guess what? The kids get exercise, the parents get exercise in a natural way. It's a safe and fun exercise to really bring a community together. Um, and make that healthy choice the easy choice. We work with grocery stores, we work with restaurants, back to the donut hole. So when you walk into a restaurant, we help our restaurants, participating restaurants, redesign their menus so that when they're looking at the menu, how many of you have gone in and choose the one that's got a little V next to it when there's been like fried chicken and biscuits on top of that, right? It's back to that, how do you make the healthy choice the easy choice? Menu design, it turns out, is a key element to this. Think about your grocery stores. When you're in the checkout lane and it's 5.30 and you're tired and you just wanna go home, what do you see to your left and your right as you're waiting to check out? You see candy? You see sugar drinks, you see things that are not good for your health. So when we work with grocery stores in our communities, we help them design to have a Blue Zones checkout lane where you would see fresh fruit and you would see water and you would see healthy choices. So when you're reaching out and making that impulse buy, it's a healthy choice, it's not an unhealthy choice. So we have implemented these um, programs, as I was just describing, around a concept we call life radius. So most of us live, work, and play within five miles of our home. Now, in LA, that's not entirely true. We spend, we, we go a little bit further and spend a lot longer in our cars. But essentially, that is the premise, right, of if you want to make the healthy choice the easy choice, you have to impact all of those elements around where someone lives, works, and plays as an individual. So people, the people part of what we do. Remember what I said about engagement, right? So you do need to get engagement, and so we look at ways of how do we demonstrate that people are getting engaged and staying engaged. We ask people to make individual pledges. So we have programmatic approaches to this that are then tailored and customized to the community to say, what does this look like? What are you asking people pledge, pledge to pledge to do? And then we help our communities go out and get those pledges from their members. So there can be simple things like I pledge to volunteer once a week for the next three months, or I pledge to participate in the walking school bus program. Purpose, so we have purpose workshops that we put together in communities that are hugely popular, right? We all wanna have a sense of purpose, but I know for myself, I've gone through different periods of life where you feel off your purpose or you feel kind of lost, you don't know what your purpose is anymore as you go through life changes. So we help people reconnect with what their purpose is so that they too can get out of bed in the morning and think, yes, I know why I'm happy to be in this day. And it isn't just a dredge to get out of day, out of bed in the morning, that I have a sense of purpose. And a lot of times, as I said before, that's connected into what you're gonna do in the community. But the workshop really helps people figure out their own individual sense of that, and then gives them the tools um, and the methodology to go and pursue that in their lives. We've had people who have quit their jobs and taken up new careers. We've had people who have gone back to school. Um, it really is a very powerful element of what we do with Blue Zones. Volunteering. A lot of the community activity is volunteers. Yes, we bring in a, a professional staff and we work with our stakeholders with their staff to make sure they're trained in the Blue Zones way, but a lot of this is getting people invigorated to volunteer again in their own communities and working with the volunteer organizations that are already in those communities, right? There's a lot of really great work being done by nonprofits in these communities, and we, we provide a focal point for their efforts to say, great, let's take your teen after school program and make that a part of the Blue Zones, and what are the elements of that that are working that we can then incorporate this and get you broader support and broader volunteers in order to, to make your mission better. Social networks. 
So as I said before, we're bowling alone. How do we create new and natural opportunities for people to reconnect with their communities? To people to reconnect across gender lines, across age lines, and really feel that sense of connectivity to their community through these social networks. Ooh, I think I will skip this one. Um, places. So as you heard me talk about before, we want to engage people in a critical mass to transform that life radius. So we work with grocery stores, we work with restaurants, with schools, employers, and faith organizations, and they all come together. There's the, a, a nice image of our walking school bus, um, as well as the community. And it's amazing, once people get into the spirit, like I was just in the Beach Cities um, a few weeks ago, they just celebrated their um, five-year anniversary. And the amount of energy in this ballroom, and it was a huge ballroom, this has been going on for five years. They have that sustained level of engagement there. People are proudly wearing their Blue Zones t-shirt, and they're proudly participating in the MOIs, which are group sort of walking um, and activity groups. There's smiles on their faces. I mean, the transformation is really inspirational to see in person, because it's easy to say, well, I, I don't think that'll work in my community, or people really aren't into that. People are. They're looking for someone to give that rallying cry about what this can be for them in their lives. So policy, and I think I'm very uh, pleased to hear when we get to the panel part of this and the questions and people talk about it. So policy is a third pillar of what we do in Blue Zones. Now, before anyone gets upset, we don't have a preset menu of policies or recommendations that you have to have a sugar drink tax or any of these kinds of things. This is community driven. Communities decide what are the policy elements that they are willing to tackle in their community. So I will share with, um, you some examples of the built environment, right? So the built environment, and you can see it right here in beach cities. In the beach cities in California, if you are a bike rider or on the biking path, you could ride freely from Manhattan Beach to Hermosa Beach. But there was literally a wall when you got to Redondo Beach where there was no more bike path, it just ended. Well, the impact of the community of Redondo Beach was they had a pier just like the other two beach communities, but nobody went there. They had restaurants that would come and go. They would have you know, tourist businesses of the, of the tchotchke things that you buy on piers. Their attendance at that pier, their traffic for those stores and restaurants was severely under what we saw in Manhattan Beach and Hermosa Beach by the sheer built environment aspect of this wall ending the bike path. So one of the policies that they decided to take on in the built environment was to take money that had been earmarked for road expansion to make it easier to drive and redirect that money towards expanding the bike path to go all the way down. And they have done it, and it has been a tremendous impact of the revitalization of the businesses on that pier in Redondo Beach has been astounding, right? That is the impact of coming in and looking at your overall environment and saying, what can we do that not only makes the healthy choice the easy choice, but that can drive traffic to your businesses on a local basis. Food policy, as I said before, many of us, some of us may want to see a sugar drink cereal tax, uh, sugar drink tax. We don't have a position on that. If your community cho chooses to take that on, we can certainly bring best practices of how you do that. Um, smoking is another area that we tend to look at in terms of policy measures that cities can impact. Um, again, coming from um, the beach cities, California tends to rank lower in smoking um, than the nation. Um, so they had a very low starting point to begin with, but they decided to work towards a smoke-free zone for all three of these communities, but they didn't do it initially through policy. They added this on after they had built out an initial community consensus that this was the kind of community they wanted to have. So rather going and having this controversial debate about whether or not we should ban smoking, they actually waited a couple years and built up enough momentum within the community that when this became a ballot measure, it passed without a problem. There were no objections. The community had decided for themselves, this is the kind of community we want to have. So our colleagues at Blue Zones on a daily basis in the communities we work with impact people, places, and policy to make the healthy choice the easy choice. We have a blueprint of how we put these together. Um, we look at human capital, we look at engagement, we have innovative products to support these things, and then the measurement. The measurement is a really key piece of this, and um, I don't think I have it in here, according to the slides, uh, about the measurement. I do want to talk about the measurement a little bit, because it's something that we're 
um, quite excited about. So the value of this is determined on our level of measurement for this. So you heard me talk a little bit about lifestyle risks. So this is something that goes back to the core of what Healthways has been doing for a very long time. We do have a partnership with Gallup, um, as Larry mentioned, um, to produce what we, is the Wellbeing Index. The Wellbeing Index is a nightly survey we do with Gallup. They call out in the US in a random sample 500 people. And they're asking them a series of questions about the drivers of well-being in their lives. And we create this well-being index and publish it, and we use it. We've had some um, recent uh, positive press around our work on heart attacks and you know, where is the incidence of heart attack the greatest and what are the drivers of that. We have a, a piece that came out recently on the built environment and where are the communities that um, can make you healthy and where are the ones that are not making you healthy. Um, so that's with our work with Gallup. That actually ties to um, other metrics in the community that we're using. So if your goals in your community that you choose for yourselves are that I want to have um, a stress reduction, which is an element in the well-being index, we can get to very particular customized metrics on that for a community to make sure, okay, if this is a goal that you've set for yourself and these are the elements you're going to bring to that, how do we measure to know whether or not we are on track to actually have an impact on that? Um, and then media value, so we do track how many media hits a community is getting um, in some communities because it has seen positive ability to, to bring in grant money. We track that and report that out as well. Um, but it's very important that we look at these things. And I do want to share, I'll see if I get to this. So the well-being index. Just for curiosity, I had our colleagues at Gallup run Buffalo and New York. So are you ready? So, good news and bad news, and I am willing, we'll share this with you in a e follow-up email, so anyone who wants to see the overall report for New York and for Buffalo and the communities, uh, we can send it to you. So Buffalo ranks second to last in terms of the major metropolitans on the well-being index in New York. Not so good. Bad news. So when we dig into the elements, so we look at smoking, inactivity, poor diet, stress, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, depression, cancer, physical pain, and obesity. These are sort of the buckets of the well-being index. Buffalo is in the red on inactivity, on high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes. You are in the orange, which is the second to bottom category next to red, on smoking, depression, cancer, physical pain, and obesity. These are key elements that we at Blue Zones can help you impact. These are key elements that are driving those numbers that I'm sure you all talk about in your own organizations about why is this and why is that. They all come down from our perspective to what are the lifestyle choices that are happening in your community every day, right? And they're not, from our perspective, just one thing, right? As you heard me talk about up till now, they're interrelated to each other. So if you're stressed out, you're much more likely to smoke. It is not an educational issue that people smoke. Otherwise, doctors and nurses wouldn't be some of the biggest chain smokers there are, right? It's not that people don't know that smoking's bad for them, but there are environmental factors that make it difficult to quit smoking from our perspective, right? Are you surrounded by people who smoke? When you go out to eat or go out to a bar, is that the norm that you get up and you get out of your chair and you go outside and smoke, right? How does your environment, your community, impact smoking cessation? Because it is not a content issue. It is not. We all know that smoking is bad for us, yet this, these numbers persist, right? Are you for, surrounded by a community that when you get off of work, you go and you continue to sit down? Or are you in a community that says, hey, it's 5 o'clock, let's go, we have our walking group, and we're going to go walk for half an hour? Or at lunch break, right, we have a walking group, we're going to go walk at lunch. That is the impact the community has on these very physical measures of well-being that I just talked about. So Buffalo is not looking so good. Not judging anyone, you're not alone. <laughs> um, there's a lot of communities out there like this, um, but we work with them. So lest you think that the beach cities, well, I don't know those of you who know Hermosa Beach or Manhattan Beach, it is a fairly affluent community in LA, it is. But this program works across socioeconomic communities. It works across demographics. It isn't just, oh, you have to be affluent and have to be here on well-being in order to move the needle. We can work anywhere. We're working in Dallas-Fort Worth, Right now, 
850,000 people, a very diverse community. It's diverse in ethnicity and language. It's diverse in socioeconomics. And we are making the same approach to Dallas and Fort Worth that we use in the beach cities to impact their well-being, and it's working. We've worked in Iowa, across the entire state of Iowa. We work in Oregon in um, some economically depressed communities that have really suffered from the logging industry and the decline of the logging industry in their communities. So it doesn't matter where you're starting on that continuum of well-being. You could have been at the top of the New York communities and still have room for improvement, right? What matters is that the community has raised their hands and said, we want to move. We want to literally move our community from those numbers that we don't see as good for us and where we want to go as a community. And we want to move that forward in some form or fashion. So these are some of the sponsors of our um, Blue Zones, as you can see here on the map. So we work in Naples, Florida. We work in Iowa, Albert Lee, Minnesota, Oregon, California, Hawaii, Fort Worth. Um, I think we have Wisconsin coming online. Um, Michael, my colleague here, knows the, the actual locations better that are coming up. But who sponsors this? Who says, OK, I want to impact this in my community? Well, it depends on the community we're talking about. But as you can see by this list here, a lot of it are health plans, because um, health plans are obviously the ones at the end of the day who are bearing the cost of these unhealthy lifestyle choices. Um, but not in all cases. So in the case of Naples, Florida, and in Fort Dallas, Fort Worth, it's actually health systems themselves. Whether or not they are out on the curve in terms of ACOs and value-based care is somewhat of a driver for these. But in general, they say that I have a, a duty to my community to make a positive impact in their health and well-being, and I'm going to take this format to bring to that. In many cases, for example, in uh, Texas, in Texas Health Resources, they have the funds to finance the entire Blue Zones themselves, but they've chosen not to, because they've realized that if I'm going to impact my community in a positive way, I want to make sure I have all the stakeholders involved in this. So they formed a 501c3 and invited the largest employers in their area to join, and, and invited some of the largest philanthropy organizations to join, because they wanted to make sure that this had a lasting impact over time. And Research has shown that when people have skin in the game, they're much more likely to participate and stay engaged to important variables on this transformation. Um, so that's how they've chosen to do it. But in all of these cases, right, there was a lead instigator, if you will, somebody who's raised their hand and said, yes, I want this. Now, another key element that we've discovered over time, and we see um, well working well in Hawaii, is that you also want to make sure that the community wants this for themselves. And by the community in this case, I mean individuals living within the community. This is not something that's done to them. This is something that's done with them. Because how are you going to get engagement and how are you going to get sustained change if the community members don't feel a part of this? So we usually go in for um, an initial uh, consultation where we also look at and gauge what is the level of community receptivity to this concept. Are people excited about it? Do they want to? So how we gauge that is we create competitions. So in the case of Hawaii, for example, HMSA said, we want to sponsor this. We want to do this. Let's see which communities want to go first. So rather than them choosing based on their own costs and risk profiles, they actually put out the call and said, hey, we're willing to do this and bring this to your community. You prepare a proposal of why we should choose you. Wow, this is tremendous energy around this. Like, oh, we want this. This sounds good. And so communities themselves then got together and put together their proposals and competed to be the blue zones that HMSA sponsored. They have three now, and they're about to launch three more. And that momentum continues, because now the rest of Hawaii can see the initial three and the results they're getting and say, well, I want that too for my community. So again, that engagement works. Um, to build sustainability over time, because at the end of the day, behavior change, which is what we're talking about here, is hard. And again, making the healthy choice the easy choice starts with individuals every day making the right choice, which is a hard thing to do if someone feels like, oh, this is another policy I have to do, this is something they want me to do. It can't be imposed on communities. People have to want it for themselves. They have to raise their hands at all different levels of that in order for this to work. So, the well-being score, I, I shared with you the Buffalo bad news, but let's just put that in context here. So you can see in the dark blue is the highest in terms of well-being rankings, and then so on down there. So you can see geographically what does well-being look like in America today. And this is at the highest level, and again, happy to share with anyone who's interested in, in more detail around this. So if you think about 
how this lays out, there's probably some obvious hypotheses here, right? But if we layered on where blue zones are occurring and what it does in terms of moving their ranking up on well-being, it's a fascinating study. So Oregon has decided to take this on. As you can see, they're in the fifth quintile in terms of well-being. California, we started pretty high. We're, we're known for you know, our tan, beautiful lifestyle, and it's true. Um, but there's still plenty of work to be done there. So in the beach cities, I shared with you some of the positive uh, things. But I will say that they're still working on stress. So just because you live in an affluent community and you can have your uh, bike path and all of those things doesn't mean that there aren't well-being elements that you still need to work on. So stress, which can be a big driver of healthcare um, decline over time, is still an element in the beach cities that they're working on. So just some interesting uh, information there. We put out a national ranking um, with our partners at Gallup on an annual basis. And this year, we'll be sh uh, sharing it with the governors of all of uh, 50 states about where does their state rank in this and who are the problem communities or cities within their state. So the Blue Zones project results in beach cities. Over our five years there, we have helped them reduce their smoking incidence by 17%. They already started below the national average. They even started below the California average, and we're still able to reduce it another 17%. 50% drop in childhood obesity. The walking school bus works. Kids need to move. They need to have healthy food choices in their schools and in their environments. 9% drop in daily stress, as I said before, this is a good movement in the right direction, but it's an element that they're still working on. 7% boost in exercise. Healthy choice, the easy choice. So one of the elements that we've done there um, is actually what's something we call MOIs, which are groups that we help facilitate the creation of. So we'll invite the community to come to the community center, for example, to find out more. And we'll walk them through what these groups are and then divide them up into groups that then continue to work together, whether it's biking or walking or yoga or meditation. We help facilitate that because people don't know how to do it on their own or they already be doing it, right? So how do you facilitate them connecting with each other? We actively participate in that and then let those groups sustain themselves over time. 7% boost in exercise in the beach cities. And again, this is an active community to begin with. And a 5% boost in healthy eating. So again, in our surveys, we're asking people what's the incidence of fruit and vegetable consumption on a daily basis? What are you doing in terms of sugar drinks, et cetera? And then we report that back. Again, lest you think this only works in affluent communities, here's Iowa. So we did result, uh, work across Iowa, so this wasn't just in one or two communities, it was actually a statewide initiative. And in the Iowa communities, a 50% drop in smoking, 15% drop in obesity, 50% of their cities, citizens went from not engaged at all or uh, lightly engaged to highly engaged. This was a rallying point for these communities in Iowa. They were looking for someone to come and help them become more engaged in their communities. 12% boost in exercise, 12% boost in healthy eating, and 70% average awareness of the project. As I said before, this isn't an accident. This is a key element of the Blue Zones project work and something we take quite seriously and measure from day one of our um, involvement in the community. Where are we in the engagement and awareness of a community? Where do we need to adjust? So we help our clients. We don't just like, set this up for you and say, set it and forget it. We're actually constantly monitoring this with our clients to make sure it's moving in the right ways. So Albert Lee, Minnesota, was our first community um, that we tried this reengineering with. And so they've obviously been at it for the longest amount of time. 49% drop in healthcare claims. 70% drop in smoking. 10 miles added of sidewalks and bike lanes. Albert Lee was where Dan Butner and, um, and the Blue Zones Project realized that this policy element of the built environment, and I'm very curious to hear uh, Corey's comments when we get to the panel part of this, right? There is money out there in our communities for doing certain things, but are we using it with a long-term view of what's best for our community when we make these investment choices? So in the case of Albert Lee, they redirected money that was going to widen the, the road that went through the main street. That was their earmark for this money. Add another lane so people could drive through town. After getting involved with the Blue Zones and realizing the impact of that and from a well-being perspective and looking at other ways they could deploy that money, they chose to not do that 
and to actually make their downtown more walking friendly. So people will come and shop park and shop and walk rather than drive through Main Street. And they'd redeployed that money to build a bike path and walking path across the lake that was literally a part of their community, but nobody used because there was no walking path. So if you're gonna... now they've got tens of thousands of people walking hundreds of thousands of miles and biking across this lake as a form of exercise. It is that simple sort of transformation, but it takes a holistic perspective of what kind of community do we want to be and how do we get there? And then that kind of dedication to say, okay, we are going to do this. Seven and a half million dollar annual healthcare cost savings in Albert Lee, Minnesota. This is not a huge community. It's not nearly the size of Buffalo, but they were able to achieve that kind of annual healthcare cost savings by engaging in the blue zones. This one, should I play a video, Michael? I don't remember what this video is. Yep. So now let's see, rather than me talking all the time, what it looks like in action. Mm -hmm. Or not. No, or not. Am I doing something wrong? Well, for those of you interested, apparently I cannot do this. We're happy to share the videos with you. Is it not connected to the internet? I think it's trying to go to. It's. Hmm. Okay, well, imagine your minds. <laughs> a bunch of happy, active kids. Excuse me for just a second. <laughs> we'll try meditation now. Close your eyes. Imagine your mind. Happy kids. <clears throat> While he's trying. So a couple of the different elements of how do we work with schools, right? Again, this is not something where we're dictating to the school or the schools what they should do. It is a conversation around what do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? And then us bringing the best practices and possibilities to them for them to choose from. Sometimes those are elements that we have done. Sometimes they're elements they have on their own. So again, back in the beach cities, they chose to bring a mindfulness program to their schools. And so kids in the elementary school level are being introduced to mindfulness and meditation within the school uh, curriculum every day. It's uh, actually something that was developed by Goldie Hawn, of all people, um, called Mind Up. But it is a school-based curriculum. And it's just got amazing results and buy-in from the schools. The walking school bus is a piece of this. Community gardens and school-based gardens, right? So helping them design and plant um, and, in, in, um, and weave in the gardening concept into the school curriculum. So these are some of those elements, and it's OK. <laughs> we'll keep going. So one of the pieces I'll give an example of is I actually live in a community of uh, Los Angeles called Encino. And I am a prime example of how this could be impacted if we brought Blue Zones uh, to more community. Because when I saw the walking school bus uh, for the first time, I was like, oh, we need this. Because as I said before, I grew up in a place where you walk to school. We have valet parking, if you will, valet drop off at our school. That's our way of choosing to have parent volunteers. We all volunteer in the morning to stand there so people can drive up their car. You open the door, get the children out and go. Rather than using that same amount of time, same amount of free labor force to walk kids to school. It, it's that simple. It, it, once I saw it, I was like, well, yeah, that is kind of dumb. Why do we do it that way? But you know, that adage that nobody walks in LA is true. So it's part of our culture and it's a culture we need to change. Oh. It's a, apparently a private video. It wasn't, but it's okay. Let's we'll right. go back to the slides. Thank you, though, for trying. Sorry. And we're moving along. So here is a quote from one of our, which you can't uh, hear anyone go, but this is somebody um, from Iowa, I believe. Um, Blue Zones Project helped our community set amazing, aggressive, and achievable strategies that moved the public health agenda further in 10 months than what I could have expected in 10 years. This is not a, um, a solo experience here. 
So one of the things, as um, Larry said in the introduction, I manage our partnership with John Hopkins, and Johns Hopkins is in Baltimore. Baltimore is a city and community that has had a lot of very public problems. Um, and when we started to talk with them in July about taking Blue Zones to the next level, one of the things I was curious about um, from their academic research side was, what would we need to change about Blue Zones, if anything, to make it work in somewhere like Baltimore? And so we had this really interesting conversation of um, one of their professors in the public health school actually has been in the mayor's office for Baltimore for many years. She's worked in the governor's office. She's very well versed in, in Maryland politics and, and the barriers you might have. And one of the things she said to me as we started to talk about blue zones and how, what works, what is the secret sauce here, right? She could see the benefit because in her experience in Baltimore, there's 100 groups pursuing 100 different agendas with 100 different sources of funding, and there's no coordination amongst them. And then people become very protective of this is my budget, this is my project. I don't want to collaborate with you because I might lose my funding or I might be diluted in some way. And so unfortunately, none of these projects, which are all very noble efforts and based on, you know, in many cases, very good solid approaches, but there's no coordination. There is no view of a citizens of Baltimore's overall well-being. There's a view of a teenage after school program and a view of workforce development and a view of elders, but there's nothing about it that's bringing those people all together in a way that we all do live our lives, right? And saying, you know what, we're gonna paint a vision of improving the well-being of our community, of our members, of our citizens. And we're gonna go about this. So her, when we talked about it this way, it really, the light bulb went off of this comment from, from Lois is not a small thing, right? It is the secret sauce of Blue Zones. And we are able to come in and work with the community and bring all of the stakeholders to the table to set a community vision and goal and then help them achieve it. And we help them achieve it step by step in collaboration, citizen by citizen, in a sustainable way over time. And so when I started to think about that, it's, it's just, as I said, I get very passionate about Blue Zones because we have the results, we have the data to show, I'm a data person, so we have the data to show that we are moving the needle in positive ways, and this stuff works, right? It's not hard, but it is hard work. It takes dedication, it takes focus, it takes determination, and it takes a village, to quote, um, famous person, it does take a village. It takes our villages to step up and say, we want to make a true change in how we live together as a community in our well-being. We believe in this and we're going to invest in this in our time and our energy and our money to make a better place for each of us and each of our families and our communities. So that is in essence what Blue Zones is about. Um, I think we're going to go to the panel now. Happy to answer questions, and as I said before, we do have data around Buffalo, New York, so for those of you who are data junkies like myself, happy to share that. We will be sharing it in an email as a follow-up after this. So thanks a lot for your attention. Let me introduce our panelists, uh, and starting from your right, we have Dr. Gail Burstein. Of course, you all know Dr. Burstein, the Erie County Commissioner of Health, John Craik, the executive director of the P2 Collaborative. Corey Smith, who is a professor at the UB School of Architecture and Planning. And Dr. Joanne Cobbler, a cardiologist, well-known cardiologist with the Buffalo Medical Group. So each of the panelists is going to give a, a, a five-minute reaction to the Blue Zones concept, how it might apply or might not apply here in Western New York. And we're gonna start with Dr. Burstein. We have to share microphones here, so. We're good at sharing, usually. So uh, good morning. Thanks for coming on this uh, um, lovely brisk morning to, uh, to talk about how we can make our communities healthy. So from a public health perspective, what we try to do is change systems so it makes it easier for people to make healthier choices. So it makes it almost automatic because that's kind of the, the flow of how we do things. And so you don't have to think about maybe doing something else. This is what we usually do. It's, it's just, it's the, it's the low hanging fruit. So uh, um, for example, uh, we try to change policy to make it easier 
for people to make healthy choices. So an example of that would be in our Board of Health, we had a food policy council. And this is, uh, consists of experts in our community around food. And they tackle uh, issues and provide guidance of all aspects of food, uh, starting from uh, growing and distributing to actually dispose, uh, you know, healthy disposal, such as is composting. So uh, they um, come together and, uh, and really try to make policy to make it easier for people to make healthier choices with their diet. So an example of that would be uh, coordinating, say, with food hubs to help organize where local uh, you know, farmers and, uh, and uh, people that um, you know, uh, create food uh, are able to uh, bring all their food to these food hubs these really mass distribution centers. And then the food hubs are able to uh, develop relationships with entities in the community that could really benefit from local healthy food. So kind of a farm, um, farm to table concept. And they can do this with restaurants. Um, they can do it with uh, local you know, corner uh, market stores. Uh, they can do it with schools to help schools uh, you know, get uh, healthier food, say fruits and vegetables for their students. So making a coordinated effort and kind of an automatic path to get that healthy local food into the community. Um, also, uh, what one, uh, one aspect of policy that our Food Policy Council consults are is on, on zoning codes, um, you know, especially for the city of Buffalo. So they've helped to create uh, urban farming communities and um, community gardens that, that were discussed earlier and um, multi-land use where restaurants would be able to grow their own food on their property and, and uh, use that you know, to, to, for ingredients on their menu. Also looking at, um, at uh, zoning to allow these green grocer marketers. So these are, uh, you, if you go to New York City, you probably see them, these carts that and, you know, instead of carrying you know, pretzels or hot dogs, they carry fresh produce, fruits and vegetables. So again, um, if you're hungry, uh, um, you know, instead of necessarily having to go for a, uh, a, a hot dog, Nathan's hot dog on the, on the corner, you'll have options to go and get some um, you know, fresh fruit, especially uh, you know, fresh fruit cups that are they're already uh, pre-cut, you know, that's easier to uh, take and go. Also uh, working with um, communities to help develop composting. So, uh, you know, not only local residents, but also about larger restaurants that generate a lot of food waste and help them recycle it to make fertilizer and, and a healthier community instead of a landfill. Um, also, uh, just I mean, make, making some structural changes to make it easier for people to get access to healthier food. So I know we've all heard of Michelle Obama's uh, concept of food deserts. So what we've been trying to do is work with these like local bodegas or uh, corner stores, you know, communities that don't have access to larger supermarkets, and help them think about how to uh, not only you know carry healthy foods in their store, but also uh, help them market it. So it would be uh, um, working with the community and doing surveys of the people that that uh, utilize the store and asking them, well, if we were, if this store was to, to purchase um, or to be able to sell um, fresh produce, what would you buy? So you can imagine that uh, one of these corner bodegas that sells cauliflowers is probably not gonna do very well rather than selling, um, say, you know, uh, like greens or, um, or foods that, that the people in the community are, are used to cooking with. Um, also providing some you know, cooking, free cooking classes, um, and then working with the sinus of the store. So uh, putting the, the fresh fruits and vegetables in, in an area where um, um, it's easy to see rather than the, the, uh, the cookies and uh, uh, sugared cereals. Um, again, it's another thing that we've done structurally, the health department, is in our parks, we've created some walking paths and we've mapped them out and we've rated their difficulty. So if people want to go to the park, um, you know, if they're in the park already and they uh, say an adult wants to take a walk, um, they'll know exactly where to go and understand what challenges they may find in uh, uh, ahead. 
So I'm going to stop there, but just to, you know, just to emphasize that in public health, the most efficient strategy is making systems changes, either structurally or through policy, to make it easier for people to make healthier choices in, the, in their lives. Thanks. John? I have pictures. Terrific. OK, thanks. This is kind of fun because we're all kind of riffing off of each other, which, which is terrific. There's a lot of coming together. I also want to say real quick, with apologies, it was real nice, Carissa, to see a map of the United States with Florida shaded blue. That was refreshing. <laughs> to, sorry. So I've got five minutes. I'm going to go real quickly. And again, some of this is a little bit redundant, but hopefully more complimentary than, uh, than repetitive. Um, just want to take a real quick look at what's happening in Western New York, talking about the CDC pyramid, which people might be familiar with. And then the uh, Joseph Stalin quote is there as a cheap way to try to get your attention. Um, you talked about how Buffalo is second in the, in the state, second worst in the state, and here's kind of a visualization. Uh, this is from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the University of Wisconsin, and in this map we're dark green instead of red. But you can see the Bronx, out of the 62 counties in New York State, the Bronx is number 62. Uh, the western New York region, the five counties, dark green there, were 55, 57, 58. Um, really, really, really bad outcomes, so the largest population area outside of New York City with really, really bad health outcomes. I don't have time to get into it now, but you, if you look just to our east, you'll see a lot healthier counties. Somebody, hint, hint, ask about why that is. It's interesting. So what's driving this? This is the CDC food pyramid, which my staff rolls their eyes at uh, every time I roll it out in meetings. But what you'll see is that we're, what's really driving this, and, and Carissa talked quite a bit about this, is really the bottom of the pyramid. So socioeconomic factors, education, uh, racial and ethnic disparities, problems like that that are really driving the problems. Um, and it's really about the community, the environment, and how the community and the environment drive behaviors. Um, again, going back to Carissa's one of her early slides, 50% of the health outcomes were determined by behaviors, and there's obviously a very, very strong connection between an environment and those behaviors, so we'll talk about that. Um, real quick, a friend of mine was in the Peace Corps years and years ago, and I asked him, you know, do you need more doctors, do you need more medicine to keep people healthier in Africa? And he said, no, what we need are bulldozers and, and trucks so that we can have a better sanitation system. And I thought that was interesting. In the developed world, what's the, our equivalent of a poor sanitation system? It's the poor choices we're making. So again, we are eating poorly, we are not exercising, we are smoking, we are drinking too much, and we're stressed out. So we've got different types of challenges, but again, they're, they're community health given ch challenges that are driven by our behaviors. So the Joseph Stalin quote, jo Joseph Stalin once quipped that a million deaths is a statistic, one death is a tragedy, and the, the, the lesson there is a story. So, you know, statistics are interesting, but to really get to the truth of a matter, sometimes it's good to hear a story, even if it's a, fic if it's a fictionalized story. So I'm going to tell you two stories, very quick versions of, of two stories uh, about uh, a family living on the west side of Buffalo. And I'd like you to pay attention to three different things. Um, first, notice how little I talk about the top of the pyramid. All right, we're talking about people's health, and I'm talking very, very little, pr practically nothing, about counseling and education and clinical interventions. I'm really looking at the socioeconomic factors, and that's what's driving the health. The other thing, and why I have the Buffalo Niagara Partnerships phone number there, is because socioeconomic factors impact health, but health really impacts socioeconomic factors. And Carissa, you talked about employers and other communities. Honestly, the business, the employer community, with very few exceptions, rich products, um, doesn't get this stuff. They, it's just not on our radar screen. Community health is not a priority for the business community in Western New York, and we'd love to change that. So. Rosa and Maria moved to Buffalo from Mexico in 2014, before the wall was built. Um, and they moved to Buffalo earlier this year. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. Earlier this year. Um, Rosa's very hardworking. She's ambitious. She's holding down two jobs, and she's attending classes at night. They live on Herkimer Street in an uh, apartment with very poor ventilation that always seems to be stuffy and too warm. Rosa, as a mother, knows, she knows, she's supposed to get fresh produce for Maria. But to get it, she'd have to take two buses, and she'd have to buy food that would probably spoil because her apartment doesn't have dependable uh, uh, electricity, so her refrigerator's always on the fridge. So it's just not a, not a good option for her. She also knows that Maria, her daughter, should get out and play more. But the street's not safe. 
safe, it's cracked, it's not well lit, and frankly, the traffic on the west side of Buffalo is picking up, and it's just not safe for her to be out. On top of all of this, uh, Rosa had suffered some abuse when she was in Mexico, and uh, she, she, she keeps having recurring men mental health issues. Over the course of the past month or so, as the weather's turned colder, Maria's health has deteriorated, her daughter, her health has deteriorated, and she's had trouble breathing. So Rosa has kept Maria home from school, isolating her socially and jeopardizing her academic performance, thinking that she's got asthma and she really shouldn't be exercising at school, she should stay at home. So there's a downward spiral that you can see here. And as Maria gets sicker and sicker, Rosa loses one of her jobs and she has to drop out of night school. All right, so, so, so that's, that's a very, very real situation that a lot of people in Western New York are, are, are facing. So let's change that a little bit. Marie and Rosa live on the west side of Buffalo on Herkimer Street in an apartment. And at her night class, Rosa discovered that there's a landlord's, t uh, I'm sorry, a tenant's rights organization that takes irresponsible landlords to court. So Rosa has learned that she can get her apartment clean, she can get an upgraded HVA system, HVA system and get mold removed from the apartment. All of a sudden, her daughter's breathing problems are not a problem. Rosa also has access to a healthy community store, healthy corner store. And I want to jump in real quick. In Buffalo, Western New York, we are starting to break down. We're really making good progress. A lot of the barriers that used to silo all of these efforts. So there are, there was a ribbon cutting last Friday. There were 27 partners involved in this, um, flipping corner stores. Erie County is playing a leadership role, ECMC, a lot of organizations, P2, but there's 27 of us flipping corner stores so that now Maria can find food that she likes, that she knows how to prepare, that Rosa will eat in the family. So that's something that's working very, very well, and we need to do more of it. We're also doing, again, Erie County's taking some lead on this more complete streets work so that Maria, the daughter, can go out and play, ride her bike, walk, and get exercise. So at the end of this story, they're thriving. Rosa still has some mental health issues, but her pastor went through a mental health first aid training course, and as the name implied, the pastor was able to provide a little bit of mental health first aid to keep Rosa functioning well enough, finding additional supports so that she could thrive and frankly become a uh, productive, tax-paying member of Western New York. Thank you. Corey. Thank you. Good morning. My thanks go to the organizers, hosts, and sponsors. I'm enthusiastic to be here on behalf of the University at Buffalo, and in particular, the Community of Excellence in Global Health Equity, um, of which I'm a member and where we have faculty engaged with international and local partners to address important issues uh, globally and in our region, uh, including affordable housing, food equality, air quality, uh, refugee health, and complete streets, just to name a few. <clears throat> My contribution is really from the perspective of architecture, planning, engineering, and other areas that affect our built environments uh, and that influence both the preservation as well as the transformation of our natural and built environments and certainly those things that influence health. Many times when we assess or look at the quality of a school, we assess the quality of the school based on the quality of the teachers and student outcomes. Of a hospital, we base it on the quality of physicians and quality of care. Of a corporation, we often look at the quality of the employees and the quality of the leadership. And in government, we often look at the quality of the elected and appointed officials. But at the same time, we also need to be looking at how location and the design of school matters. For example, learning outcomes are affected up to 20% by the built environment. So the way a classroom is designed and made influences learning by 20%. The location and the design of the hospital matters. The location and the design of the office matters. The location and design of the civic institutions matter. The Blue Zones Initiative is built upon research that just simply illustrates that place matters. Places include the genetic and social fabrics of the place, the policies, institutions, and programs of the place, and the natural and built fabrics all have some relationship to well-being and longevity, as we've heard. 
Blue Zones also points to uh, research that illustrates differences and disparities between places. Differences in climate, ecology, food, music, built environments, as well as disparities in health outcomes and quality of life. Differences occur at many scales, whether this is country to country, city to city, or individual to individual. In Buffalo and Western New York, for example, as John was just describing, we see great disparities between residents of one neighborhood and another, between one household and another, between one individual and another. So the key point I'd like to add to the conversation today as we think about blue zones and that concept and promoting a healthier Western New York is to keep a mind toward equity and fairness and to add, uh, address issues of disparities in health and well-being by addressing, in my case, planning and design in order to look at some of the hidden and unintended consequences of planning and design. There's an importance of keeping all stakeholders in mind, including those most vulnerable populations, as well as stakeholders we might not think of firsthand. And how do we address the needs of these potentially most vulnerable populations? Addressing the needs of children, as well as their grandparents, residents of rural communities, as well as residents of impoverished urban neighborhoods, refugees and immigrants, and other new arrivals to our region, even if they've just flown in. LGBT older adults, for example, as well as members of religious minorities, because each has different needs and preferences in terms of the built environment, as well as in health services. Equity is often discussed as an ethical imperative, and health disparities, as well as differences between physical environments, have reverberating effects. But diminished well-being in one neighborhood, one household, one individual impacts everyone's well-being. I'll take one example, and then I'm going to leave you with a couple of questions. I'm a professor, so I like to end with questions rather than the other way around. The example I'll use is the example of a children's museum and ask the question, who do we design children's museums for? Well, children, right? But clearly, as is evident by the hundreds of new children's museums that have existed uh, or, or that have come into being around the world, it's one of the fastest growing architecture programs in the world right now are children's museums. And those most successful ones don't design just for children, but they design for the full spectrum of age, they design for the full spectrum of ability, and they design for the full spectrum of needs and preferences, including all sorts of additional programming that isn't necessarily child-centric. Planning, engineering, and design decisions are never neutral, never equal in their end impacts on communities, stakeholders, or individuals. So my two questions for you, the panel, I suppose. Uh, the pair of questions. We often talk about healthcare access, but I would like to talk about two other kinds of access. How might we improve access to high quality natural and built environments, again for everyone, and at the same time, I think one path in that regard, is how might we improve access to the decision making process and the processes that inform how we locate how we design, how we build, how we maintain, and how we transform our parks, schools, bus stops, streams, daycare centers, homes, and clinics. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Dr. Kabler. I'm a, a clinical cardiologist. Uh, kind of, now we're going down to the individual person. I'm dealing with one-on-one -on -one people. I um, have a huge practice. I've been doing this for 30 years in this community, almost 30 years in this community. And basically, I see patients who have heart disease. Um, they've had a heart attack already. They've already had problems. And I see a ton of patients for prevention. I treat high cholesterol, um, high blood pressure. People come to me um, because they want to prevent, like they have a family history, they come to me. They say, how can I prevent this? How can I stop myself from going down the same path as the rest of my family? 
So, I mean, every day I'm seeing tons of patients and, you know, we work with medications, but the main thing I'm doing is talking to them about exercise, diet, smoking, all of the risk factors. If we look at one thing that these people can do, um, if you narrow it down, it's really their lifestyle. That's going to make the hugest difference, not the 25 medications that they need to fit the guidelines for this disease and this and this and that, and what dose should they get. Um, sure, that's important, but it's really their lifestyle. Um, and again, I have a lot of people who come to me volunteer. They, they come to me directly because they want to prevent things. So I have people who are willing, they're willing to do things, they want to work about, uh, on their problems before they develop them. I also have, you know, again, people that already have disease. So it'd be wonderful to have community to support. I feel like I, you know, again, for 30 years, I talking to them exactly, I mean, I exercise myself. I'm a good example. I watch everything I, I do. I live a healthy lifestyle. So I talk to them about what I do, what they should do. If they say the exercise, well, what do you do for exercise? Well, I babysit or I walk the dogs. Is that's not exercise. Um, and we talk about food. It's amazing. You know, they go to the hospital because they uh, had three hot dogs at Ted's. Well, and they're heart failure patients. So no, that's not what you, that's not good food. So we're constantly educating. What we did have at my practice, which had to close, was at Buffalo Cardiology, we had um, a wellness center. We had incredible results there. Um, so we can see all the things you're talking about. We looked at, we, we took patients, we had a whole team, it was medical, we had physical therapy, we had uh, exercise physiologists, and we, we had coaching, um, and we had, um, we have the data where we showed that, again, we, we taught these people to take responsibility for their health. We worked on stress management. Everything that you've been talking about, we did that in our little microcosm. You're talking about communities, but we did this and we saw the results. We had people lost 100 pounds, came off all their diabetic medication, their antihypertensives. They no longer needed their CPAP or their sleep apnea. Um, the, the sense of well-being, one of the measures we looked at was their sense of well-being. Their, incredible, their, their sense of well-being was much better. So everything you say, we did this, again, on a smaller scale, but we had the data to show this. We actually did several pilot projects for insurance companies here and showed them incredible results of people coming off their medications, but no one, no, none of the insurance companies were interested in you know, supporting this. Um, so again, it's, it's like an individual battle but we see the results. And, and now that we're not here anymore, we have, the, our director has started um, the same program um, on his own, at, uh, it's called Restore, but it's at a, at a different place and we're building up, we have the same people. But even when I see those patients who really learn about lifestyle changes, how to deal with stress, what they need to do, they may gain some weight back, but their cholesterol is still low. I mean, they, they still know what to eat. They, they, they made those changes, even if they, they fall back a little bit. And our program is, was dedicated to, really, you teach them for a certain period of time, then you're supposed to go off on your own and continue this. You're not gonna be constantly just coming back here. We're, we're teaching you to live the lifestyle. So, and again, that's what I do individually, and it was wonderful that I would have something to refer that they can reinforce all the things I do in my individual visits. Um, so to have the whole community where you are reinforcing the healthy lifestyles, um, that's just incredible. Again, the decrease in the cost for medical care, like my patients will come and say, well, okay, you know, I, they, I'm on this medication, my, my primary put me on this for blood pressure and this for cholesterol. Do I really need this? Well, right now you do. But do you think there's a chance that I can get off? Yes, well, I talk to them, I instruct them. We talk about diet, we talk about exercise. That's the most of my visit. Um, and then, you know, I bring them back, see a change in six months and eventually, Yes, okay, we can decrease this now. Yeah, you no longer need your high blood pressure medication. And I mean, I had patients, again, um, coming back to me and saying, you know, after working on this, like, you, you changed my life. Just me individually talking to them about those things. And now they finally, it might take, I mean, I see them every six months, and it might take a couple years, but it finally gets through, like, you changed my life. I feel so much better. Even referring them to our program that we had, the first thing they say, I have one thing to say to you, Dr. Cobbler, and it's thank you. I feel so much better. Everything is, I mean, they're just, they've lost the weight, their cholesterol's down. It's the whole sense of well-being. So everything you're talking about, me out in the community with each individual patient, I see a difference. Thanks, Joanne. 
Okay, we're gonna take uh, questions now from you, if you have them. Uh, we've got uh, some of my colleagues walking around with microphones. Do we have any questions for the panel? <clears throat> One way in the back there, Paul. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, I just have a question about the Blue Zones project. So it definitely sounds like it, when you first get involved with the community, it's, there's a lot to tackle. And I was just kind of wondering, um, what's your approach to kind of coming up with a timeline or deciding which aspects of the project to prioritize first? So first I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Michael Acker, who's the general manager of our Blue Zones project and has been involved since the very beginning when we began our partnership with Dan Buettner and give him a chance to, to answer that for you. Thank you, good morning. Great question. Um, for us, the pro every one of our communities looks very different, the process is very different, but it starts the same way in every community. Um, it just starts by listening and getting to know the community, the community's infrastructure, the assets, the priorities, the values, the cultures, um, and some of the things that, that you're already working on. So um, for us, it's really important that we meet the community where they're at. And, and my insight from this morning is while the challenges in Buffalo may be great you know, in terms of some of the, the health outcomes and metrics, you guys are really ahead of the curve in, in a lot of the work, the types of work and initiatives that you're already doing. And so for us, it's about figuring out what are those assets and how can we begin to strengthen, lift and enhance the things that are already happening? Um, we, don't, uh, we know that the Department of Health is already very much working on all these things. So how can we become um, infrastructure that builds that up? And so that process takes time for us. Um, we'll, we'll spend anywhere from four to six plus months getting to know a community, bringing in um, team members from our Blue Zones communities that have gone through this process, bringing in external consultants that are um, distinguished in the fields of built environment or, or working with employers and holding both a qualitative and a quantitative process. So we'll look at the data and we'll look at the measures, the county health rankings, the well-being measures. We'll also listen to the stakeholders in your community. Every, everyone from just um, family members and residents up to the, the, the community leaders. So we'll meet with the chamber and the business community, the superintendent and the PTOs and PTAs. All of those sectors that you heard Carissa talk about and through that process, we'll, we'll create a, um, a proposal and a plan. Here's the things we heard that are your priorities. Here's the things that we know are the levers that, you, that we believe you could pull and some of the things that we know that we could bring to help you do that. And that would show up in the form of what we call an assessment or a discovery report. And that would become the foundation of a blueprint that you would use to, um, to guide the work over five to 10 year period. So that's a little bit of information of, of how that process starts for us. Question, uh, uh, could you wait for the microphone because we're actually taping this, I guess. Thanks. Could you comment on playgrounds, uh, placement, uh, their success, what kind of playgrounds, you know, where they should be in a community? Yeah, the blue zones Corey, do you have a? Well, I'll take anybody. I can answer it's, um, that uh, not specific to um, playgrounds necessarily, but we just put out some research that we did with Gallup around um, active living and, and design and, um, with, with respect to a community's investments in infrastructure, parks, and trail systems. And what we now know more than ever is that um, a community's investments in parks um, are directly correlative to the health outcomes of the, that neighborhood. And so, um, and, and, that, and the health outcomes and the impact that that can have is even more disproportionately valuable to low income and underserved communities. And so that's inclusive of playgrounds, but not, um, but not um, explicitly um, um, represented only to, to playgrounds. So that would be a little bit of the, the um, research that we've done. So I would, the more playgrounds, the better. <laughs> the, the, the easier and, and greater access of not only children, but people of all ages in terms of access to play. Play is something that may, many times we associate with childhood, but play is something that all of us participate in. And there are many different forms of, of play. So creative play is different than physical play, is different than um, play in, in, in all, of its, all of its forms. What I would talk about is more the design of, of or 
first, the importance of access to play. So uh, children, in particular, process many of their own emotions and thinking through play, not necessarily through dialogue or discussion. And so particularly children who have experienced some form of trauma, play is one of the most critical things in terms of their, their development and emotional processing of those traumas. Likewise, I would say that for uh, refugee groups, uh, play becomes critically important. And not a, from the design side of things, not designing play in a way that there's only one singular form of play, but just like we all have different personalities and different preferences for food and, and, and other aspects of our built environment, we have different preferences for play and giving access to people to have different forms and aspects of play, not just playground with a swing. There's a movement certainly in playgrounds that are, that are toward creative forms of play where children actually can manipulate the play forms rather than fixed play or fixed design features to have things that are much more mobile and, and interactive with children. Dr. Morley. Uh, I noticed on the healthy corner store slide that there's a pretty strong promotion for tobacco products. So what would need to happen so that the healthy corner store would not need to sell tobacco? It, it, it's a good question, and believe me, we all noticed that too. What, one of the, the, the process, and P2 is involved in it, but I don't want to give the impression that we're the lead, because there's probably about 12 different leads out of the 27 organizations involved. But one of the, one of the things, there's a whole process for selecting which horn, healthy corner stores or which corner stores are going to be involved in the process. Um, certainly the owner has to be committed to the community, has to be committed to you know, a long-term process in terms of buying and selling the produce. Um, we look at things like crime rates. We prefer to work with stores that are clean, well-maintained, things like that. Um, honestly, picking and choosing if that was going to be a screening because at the end of the day it's a store and they have to make money. And if we were only going to choose those stores that, that didn't sell tobacco products, there probably wouldn't be any. Um, it is a problem. I know D Dr. Burstein about a year and a half ago did a, a terrific presentation on health issues in, in Erie County and talked quite a bit about how if you could wave a wand, stopping smoking might be one of the first things you'd want to target in, in, in western New York. But um, it's just, you know, we, we're meeting people where they are and, and that's not, uh, it's not ideal, but it's, it's part of what the, the hand we're dealt. Yep. I, well, uh, I think some of the stores are actually receiving some, um, you know, the government's um, tobacco money to be able to redesign the signage on their stores to move the tobacco products from a high-profile location to um, you know, farther away from where most people would see them. So we're, uh, you know, we're trying to work with uh, those corner stores to be able to make, again, those structural changes to make it easier for people to make healthier choices. Well, those are all good things, but uh, uh, the, store, the store owner really counts on that revenue. So unless you find a way to replace that revenue, they're not going to give up selling tobacco. But I mean, a novel program that would give them grant support for the missed income, and take them off the shelves, and then make it more difficult for people to buy the product, and then you might affect the smoking rates. We have a question in the back, or one here, OK. Go ahead, Nina. Okay. Um, question for Blue Zone. So in looking at one of your slides, it looks like you're really expanding across um, the United States. Um, do you have any plans to implement this in any of our other neighbors to the north here? And if so, what ideas do you have to kind of combat the fact that, especially in Buffalo, we do end up becoming dormant for the four months, sometimes feel like six months out of the year when we, we have that snow and that cold weather? Well, Albert Lee, Minnesota is not exactly. Uh, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I don't know snow levels of Albert Lee compared to Buffalo, but I'm going to guess that they're pretty uh, similar. But I'll let Michael talk That's about sure, sure. Um, our pipeline, if you yeah. will, of cities and communities and raise their hands because they want to do this. Um, I, I'm, our, our national offices are in Nashville, Tennessee, but I actually grew up, um, don't hold this against me, I grew up down the road in Syracuse, New York, so I personally have a strong commitment to seeing this happen in New York State. Um, we have had a number of conversations in New York. In fact, um, just um, six months or so, we were in Sullivan County, which is actually one of the more green counties in, in the state, um, even more so than, than here. Um, so uh, they, don't, they don't outpace the Bronx, no one, no one can, uh, they're, at the, they're really struggling, um, but 
But we have had a number of, of conversations in New York. We would love to be in the Northeast, and we are talking to a number of communities in Pennsylvania as well. Um, the, you'd be surprised, uh, Iowa's freezing cold, Oregon's freezing cold, um, and, and Fort Worth is incredibly um, oppressively hot, and so is Florida. Um, so so um, communities have their own ways of, of working through that. And, and so that may be, um, we take our walking groups into the malls in the winter in some of our communities. We form partnerships with um, community organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs and YMCAs to bring some of those groups in. Um, and so we, in every community, we'll design an engagement and a, um, an activity calendar that starts to meet the, um, meet some of those challenges. And, and that looks a little bit different in every community. I think we had a question in the back. No? Okay. Let me, let me uh, inter interject here and talk about funding uh, because uh, we spend so much money uh, on the acute side of healthcare and uh, very little money, in my opinion, on this side of healthcare. John, you mentioned the uh, current state of the employers is not maybe being uh, completely up to speed on this. Joanne, you talked about the uh, center that you created, um, I don't think any of that activity is reimbursed. You correct me if I'm wrong. No. Who, sh who should fund initiatives like this? Well, what, what we did actually with the insurance companies, the, the pilot programs, um, the patients would pay up front, but if they proceeded, then they would be reimbursed. So it's a way you have to have some investment by the person. So I certainly think, and, and again, um, they saw the results, but I think you have so many insurance. I mean, it, it's you, you, person needs to invest in it themselves in order for it to work as well. So you have to have some personal stake in it. But I do think I would rather see them paying for this than the uh, defibrillator and the 90 year old for $40,000 in the hospital who's going to live another six months. And, um, and somehow that's okay. They can pay for those, but they won't invest in, in patients who. Um, again, you're going to get rid of the medications. Some of, the, some of them said it was, we have so many different insurance companies here. Next year, they may be in a different insurance company, so why should they get someone healthy and then someone, another insurance company gets the benefit next year? Um, they saw the benefit. Um, so I think it has to be the person investing, too. But I think I, I would look at putting resources into prevention. I think there's a couple of a number of answers, two, two, two answers that come to mind. Um, first of all, the, the, the types of work we're talking about in terms of the, the walkable streets and the healthy corner stores and things like that, um, one of the things we struggle with is, you know, how, how do we show the community value and what are the outcomes? And it's going to be years and years and years before, you know, Buffalo's uh, diabetes rate goes down because of the things we're doing now. So it's such a long-term view. It's hard to get anybody to invest in something that's not going to pay pay dividends and show value in, in, in a you know, shorter, shorter time span. The other issue with the hospital systems, and, and I feel sorry for them, frankly, because um, sy systems always get the results they're designed to get, whether you know that or not. Sometimes they're designed poorly. And right now, hospitals, they, they have defibrillators, and they have to pay for those defibrillators. So at some level, they have to, they're, they're really bound to, to do the short-term fixes because that's where their funding comes from. That's what's ge generating the revenue. Um, at some point, we're going to be in a value-based payment system, but you know we're, we're not here there yet. And at some point, hopefully, it will make sense for hospital systems and payers to support healthy corner stores and walkable communities. But but it's such a long-term um, you know process that that we're just not there yet. So I think just a, a couple things on that because one of the things, and you heard me mention it, um, Healthways has developed. We are a for-profit company, right? But part of uh, what we would answer to that is. You can measure these things, and you have to measure these things. So if you want to get insurance reimbursement, we do have an intensive cardiac rehab program. It's another partnership we have with Dean Ornish, Dr. Dean Ornish. He did the clinical research and had the clinical studies, did trials with Highmark in, in Pennsylvania and with um, Mutual of Omaha to be able to have the business case to go to Medicare and actually get Medicare to reimburse our intensive cardiac rehab. Our intensive cardiac rehab program sounds a lot like what you were experimenting with here. Yeah, and it but was it associated is, with the cardiac rehab. Right? Yeah. So it is, it is laborious, but there are payers out there who will see that value and are on the hook for those costs 
and are willing to step forward and do it. So HMSA is, you saw it on one of my slides, is a Blue Zone sponsor. They're also um, reimbursed for our Ornish um, Lifestyle Medicine Program, not just for cardiac disease, for risk factors of cardiac disease, for diabetes and risk factors of diabetes. Well, why would they do this when others are saying no? They're in a unique situation. They have an 80% market share in Hawaii. They know that that patient today is gonna to be their patient tomorrow, the day after, the day after. So you know what Joanne said about, well, most insurance companies here on the mainland, that is a real economic reality for them. If I invest in a program that's gonna improve the health of that person, but maybe two or three years from now, I'm not gonna see that ROI. Why am I gonna spend the money when my competitor might get that patient next year? So it is a collective action dilemma, if you will, around these sort of individual patient programs. On the Blue Zone side of this, right, if you remember the slide I put up there, who are the sponsors of most of these Blue Zones? It is health systems, it is payers, and they are realizing through their own competitive strategies, I want to and need to do this to keep my position in this marketplace because I'm already, experience, I'm already experimenting with value-based care outcomes, whether it's through CMS programs or through bundle pay, any of the kinds of ways that they do that. So there is money out there, but no, is it as widespread and as people, you know, think to yourself, I want to do this, it's the right thing to do? No, there is an economic reality that you have to be able to demonstrate that ROI to in order to get people to pay for these kinds of programs. We had a question here. Um, it wasn't a question so much as it just, um, I think that the, it's avoiding, with Medicare and Medicaid, they have huge populations they keep forever. And the other data is that although there's, the point that people change insurers all the time, sick people don't change them nearly as much because they'll fight to stay where they are. So when we were, when I was at Blue Cross and Independent Health, the people that are changing are healthy. So they move all the time for price. It's much less unless your company just goes single. But the other thing too is the, the question of a single payer, which everybody fights, but there are advantages to that then you have one payer that has to face these problems and may be able to distribute funds. And a lot of times it was just a question of not distributing the funds. There are other areas they attack, readmissions, but those are already, that's a different area. And they don't devote the, the same time because it's just the data, it's just harder sometimes. Any other questions from the audience? We've got one, a couple right here, this gentleman in the front. Question for John. I noticed on the map of New York State that you showed, just to the east of Erie County, it seemed like some of the counties were doing a little better. Has anyone looked into why that might be? <laughs> Thank you, Don. <laughs> um, the, the story is decades old, but I think there, there's still an element of truth to it. And, and I have you know, colleagues in Rochester who I talk to, and the story is that decades ago, um, uh, one of the Wegmans, when, when Rochester was still a very, very corporate town, was speaking with the leaders of Kodak, Bausch and Loam, Xerox, and uh, very, and, and it's good and bad, it somewhat paternalistically said, we're gonna be a healthy community and we're going to invest right now in, types of, in, in the types of infrastructure that's gonna make Rochester healthy. And they set up data systems and all sorts of things that frankly are the envy of, of a lot of places. Um, it was paternalistic, which is not necessarily a good thing, but they did create a culture where the business community and the employer community recognized that community and population health was a priority for them. Um, and, and that has been paying off dividends for them. And you know, they're, they're not the healthiest community, but their demographics, particularly now, are much more, Rochester's much more like Buffalo than it used to be, but you see, see, still see, and, and the rural counties are much healthier than, than um, Western New York's rural counties, but they, they had that culture of health that's been paying off for dividends for, 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 for decades. This young man. Yes, good morning. Uh, my question is in regards to um, participation and community awareness. I think, Carissa, you mentioned that 70% was kind of um, a good participation rate, um, but also John was given a, an example about the community here in Buffalo, which has a pretty sizable um, immigrant and migrant um, uh, high numbers, at least in the west side. And um, I would like to know, how do you address kind of the um, language barrier or just kind of the, uh, adapting to a whole new society in addition to you know, uh, things that um, a lot of communities from different parts of the world are kind of used to. People walk 
just about everywhere, but they come here and they have to hibernate for four to five months <laughs> out of the year. Um, I've been here a while, but I'm still dealing with that. But how do you address those, <laughs> those particular issues that are, are relevant to this sizable uh, community here in Buffalo? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. And I think, um, so part of it is, and you heard Michael speak to it as well, of the process that we go through, because we're not imposing this and coming to a community and saying, you do it this way. Right? It's involving the stakeholders in the community in the first place to understand truly from the community's perspective of who are those stakeholders, who needs to be a part of that conversation, who are the different groups that are involved in this community, what does the community look like, what does it sound like, um, and to truly understand that from the beginning so that the blueprint that gets created about what is that action plan going to be truly reflects all of the diversity and all of the barriers and all of the challenges and all of the opportunities for whatever that community might look like, right? And so I would say all of the factors that you just mentioned would come out in that due diligence period, if you will, when we're talking to people out there in the community. We would talk to Maria and Rosa and try to understand from their perspective that story that John told, right? And really factor that into all of the beautiful tapestry that makes up our communities that we live in. Um, you know, Dallas-Fort Worth, which is a community that we're working in, has 850,000 people. It's a fairly diverse community. Language is an issue, right? It's a heavily Hispanic community, um, and it is socioeconomically diverse. So we've got the Marias and Rosas there, all the way up to, you know, the oil and gas executives who look very different. The Blue Zones has to include and engage everyone in that community. But that local or micro-local tactics that you might use are gonna vary by those micro communities within the larger community. So it is a varied approach, if you will, depending on who we're trying to engage and work with. It's the other piece of why you heard me say, and Michael said it as well, that again, we're not a host of people who descend on a community from outside of the community. The real work happens on the streets every day with like the folks sitting at this table who understand their community or are part of their community, understand those um, nuances of what is it, and we're listening to them and helping them, as Michael said, elevate what they're already doing or their visions for how they would like to do it to really collaborate and create those opportunities for change in meaningful ways that has all the voices be heard and everybody's perspectives and experiences and stories mm -hmm. become a part of that plan. Because again, you can't sustain engagement if you have someone having the experience that this is being done to me they're not really gonna engage and own it themselves and that change over time. Because again, I, I always take it back to, as Joanne said, at the, at the end of the day, those nice metrics on ROI and that savings starts with every single person in that community changing their behavior or enough of them to change their behavior over time to produce that outcome. So you really do have to start with the micro in order to get to that macro. Does that make sense? Sure, go ahead, Corey just add one layer of, one more layer of complexity to your question, <laughs> and, and also one very detailed at the tactical level example of how you might approach this. So the added complexity is that we have a high school in Buffalo where there are 150 languages spoken in one location. So while I you know, appreciate the comparison to a place like Dallas or some other place where socioeconomic diversity and language diversity is certainly there, there are few places with that intensity of concentration of cultural language and socioeconomic diversity, not to mention the range of life experiences of, of that group. So it's a, it's a really important question. I think one of the questions in, in the context of blue zones in Buffalo and how it takes place here because of that very particular challenge. One way that, or, or one opportunity and again, we could probably find lots and lots of examples in the, mic in the microcosms and, and kind of smaller cultures would be that UB, along with community partners, hosts an annual Refugee Health Summit. And through that Refugee Health Summit, many of these types of conversations emerge. So you could enter into a place like the Refugee Health Summit as a means to engage some of these con conversations. Any other questions? Okay, we are at our time. I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank Carissa for a terrific keynote address. All of our panelists for your time and presentations this morning. Thank you so much.